Often it is the case that when speaking on the topic of ethnocentrism or nationalism, many traditionalists assert that such a notion is quote-unquote modern and did not exist in the ancient world. However, this is incorrect as we will see. The ancients not only saw race, but they also formulated the design of society upon its existence, as we shall see in the case of ancient Greece. Many of the conclusions drawn here come from the book The Ancient Ethnostate, Biopolitical Thought in Ancient Greece, authored by Guillaume de Roche. However, before proceeding, it must be stated that the assertion ethnocentrism is quote-unquote modern, therefore not valuable, is fallacious. In particular, what one may call a temporal fallacy. That is to say, that time determination has in no way, shape, or form an effect on the truthfulness or moral value or any value of a notion. Time is a metaphysical and phenomenological ontology, and in itself it does not imply value upon any notion. This fallacy is no worse than an appeal to authority or some other basic form of fallacy. If ethnocentrism is a modern phenomena, it does not make a difference upon the value of the concept whatsoever. It should also be mentioned that modern is relative, or what people call modern is relative, in that what is considered modern is always contrasted with the past of a certain period, and this time we now live in will itself become a form of archaic and ancient, but at this current moment we consider it modern, or postmodern even. Furthermore, a critique of ethnocentric ideas being inherent to humanity comes from the left as well when they state that the ethnic and racial identity is but a mere sociological tool manufactured by capitalist elites to prevent the working class from uniting. This too will also be demonstrated to be false. The Greek city-states are a clear example of ethnostates, and throughout this video our focus will be on that of Athens and Sparta. These states were ruled through aristocracy, that is a rule of clans or families over one region. Citizenship of these states were only granted to the descendants of the early founders of the state with minimal exception. Along, alongside this, a citizen of the state would have to demonstrate loyalty to the state, and this would include willingness to die for the state. Citizenship was only granted to Greeks as well, and the ruling class was only allowed to be of Greek stock. When speaking of states, the Greeks referred to the city-states in an anthropological term, such as Athenians or Spartans, showing that they viewed the state not just as a mere expression of power, but also a manifestation of a people. For the Greek, the state was composed of local peoples who reflected his kinship and ancestry. On top of all this, during the Pericles democratic reforms, voting was limited to those who were descended of two Athenian Greek parents, and if a non-Athenian was caught voting, they would be executed. The Greeks were obsessed with their bloodlines and the purity of it, uh, such as whether or not one was a pure Athenian or pure Spartan. During the Peloponnesian Wars, when asking for assistance, the Greeks would often appeal to the purity of their ancestry as grounds for their war support. Both parties believed that they were fighting for the best interests of the Greek peoples. Furthermore, a recognition that multiculturalism is problematic is found in King Alcibiades' remark that the peoples of Sicily would be easier to conquer considering they are so diverse and thus not united as a people. During the Persian Wars, the Greeks despised their interior ethnic differences united in the face of exterior danger. This demonstrates a recognition of ethnic solidarity amongst all Greeks. During the wars, the Athenian leader, Themistocles, when speaking to the Ionians, states, quote, Men of Ionia, it is wrong of you to fight your ancestral line and enslave Greece. This also demonstrates an in-group preference among the Greeks. Greeks often practice slavery against one another, but thinkers such as Plato and Xenophon had thought that slavery was to be reserved for non-Greeks only, and that Greeks should not engage in such a practice. The Persian invasion of Greece is best to be seen as a race war, as when the Greeks would be captured and enslaved, they would be castrated, eliminating their bloodline and stealing their women which also shows an obvious attempt to prevent a repopulation of the Greek peoples. The Greeks not only fought against the Persians to avoid slavery, they also did so because they recognized they shared a common identity in being Greek, when the Athenians pledged to the Spartans that they would fight side by side as, quote, We are all Greeks, one race speaking the same language with temples to the gods and religious rites in common, with a common way of life, unquote. The Greeks often used pan-Hellenic 
Hellenic sentiment as a means of propaganda during the wars to maintain solidarity. This shows that they held bloodline and ethnicity as important. The Persians having a more diverse society failed to generate loyalty in times of war, such as when the Phoenicians refused to attack Carthage because lots of Phoenicians lived in Carthage at the time. The Greeks' beliefs created a mode of eugenic practices. The Greeks inherited a patriarchal mode of social organization from their Indo-European ancestors, such as a religion that puts reproduction as something of great importance and kin loyalty as well. This therefore aided their already existing ethnocentrism in that reproduction is now a highly held religious value. In the great story, the Iliad, we see a kin-based society in that on the battlefield one ought to honor their ancestors, and if a family member dies, they ought to be avenged. Herodotus also notes that the Greek ruling class was a series of families of, or aristocracies creating a sort of familial rule or mafia. Another example of kin-based society. Sparta had eugenic policies, both positive and negative. Positive in that they encouraged reproduction of, and men who had three children were exempt from military service and men who had four were exempt from taxation. Negative eugenics also played a role here in which unhealthy or sickly looking children were executed because they wanted only healthy offspring to survive. The Greeks also had strange forms of eugenic cuckoldry where a man or woman who was not fit to give children to their spouse would have either uh, some other person procreate with their spouse, whether it be male or female, generating offspring for the parent who was not seen as fit enough to do so. Plato was also very pro-eugenics, as he believed that human beings had inherent characteristics, and that because of this, to mediate society, breeding should be controlled. Namely, he was concerned with differences in temperament and physical stature. He also believed because of this, many people were not cut, to, uh, cut out to participate in philosophy. Plato also argued that one ought to be patriotic and love one's fatherland, as it is akin to loving one's family. This argument is no different than the reasoning of many ethnocentrists. The Greeks certainly saw themselves as different on racial lines as well as ethnic lines. Herodotus, when speaking about the Ethiopian states, quote, It is so hot there that the people are black, unquote. He also states that Egyptian influence upon them, staying, saying, Quote, the Ethiopians have learned Egyptian customs and become less wild, unquote. Herodotus, making more phenotypic distinctions between an Ethiopian and an Indian, saying that the ones in the east, being the Indians, have straight hair, and the ones in the west, being the Ethiopians, have, quote, curlier hair than anyone else in the world. Plato himself lamented in his book, The Laws, about that if the Athenians and Spartans did not unite to fight the Persians, there would be a destruction of the Greek race. Plato states, quote, If it were not for the joint determination of the Athenians and Spartans to resist the slavery that threatened them, we would, we would now have a complete mixture of the races, unquote. In fact, both Plato and Aristotle were extremely ethnocentric in that they thought the barbarians or northern Europeans should be enslaved and Greeks not enslaved because of common lineage. Plato, in, a, in his ideal state, also known as Magnesia, notes that the slave population should be a, of a multitude of different ethnic origins as it is much easier to rule over a people who are not united. Aristotle had thought the Greeks were the perfect balance of humanity as opposed to the Persians who were slaves and not free and as opposed to the barbarians who he considered to be undisciplined. The Greeks for Aristotle embodied the perfect mediation between freedom and slavery. Blood and kinship especially for Plato was the basis not to fight other Greeks. Clearly, the Greeks saw race and used its existence as a means to organize society. <laughs>